Hello, it's Joe Wheaton from Utah State University, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the science, not that our instruction team has been involved in, um, or some of these case studies that help build confidence in low tech, but uh, some of the other supporting science, uh, some of the emerging um, science, uh, some points of confusion, and uh, some r remaining uh, sort of knowledge gaps. The science behind what constitutes a healthy riverscape, we heard a lot about in module one. Uh, Colin laid out a nice sort of foundation there uh, for some of the stage zero and anastomosing, which Mark built upon. Um, even though Ben Goldfarb uh, claimed to uh, just be uh, sharing uh, more of a humanities perspective, which he certainly did. Um, yeah, the Eager is really well uh, researched um, and actually a great source for trying to get a handle on some of the science um, surrounding beaver. Uh, there's 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 a, there's a ton in the in the notes uh, uh, to that book. Uh, the science behind those key processes we talked about beyond beaver, though, uh, wood accumulation, uh, we haven't talked as much about yet. Uh, so there's there's a huge body of research on studying um, large wood and structural forcing by wood um, in rivers. Uh, this is a recent uh, review by Swanson um, et al. that uh, has one of the uh, sort of standard things you see in a lot of review papers, just how often is this, uh, how many papers are occurring in the literature uh, on these topics. And we're seeing this, this real growth in the recognition and the role that wood plays in rivers um, over the past few decades. There's also a lot of nice uh, sort of conceptualizations of this. Uh, one example here, this natural wood regime, uh, sort of a play on the natural flow regime. Uh, that uh, Ellen Wool and uh, the impressive list of co-authors put together and talking about this uh, sort of ecological and geomorphic integrity and diversity at the intersection of flow regime, sediment regime, and wood regime, and talking about these different wood process domains. So there's a lot of great conceptual basis um, to build off of, and indeed making the connection back to anastomosing. Uh, so uh, Angela Grinnell and Walter Patoli uh, just this year published a nice um, paper that has a, this uh, conceptual model of island development, right? These forested floodplains being forced by wood and bars turning into to islands, uh, vegetated islands, and uh, giving rise to that anastomosing plan form we kept talking about. There's also a lot of science supporting the restoration principles uh, that uh, we covered yesterday. So uh, this question of, you know, are we focusing on the noun or the verb, the form or the process is the goal. It's really, um, really brought up over and over again in the restoration literature. So this recent review by Phil Roney and others on wood placement, fact, fiction, and future directions. Uh, one of the sections in there talks about this stability of placed wood, right? This obsession with we build a structure, we expect it to last forever. And that some of that's rooted in, you know, there are certainly certain types of jams that uh, do persist for a long time, but there's a lot of jams that are much more mobile um, and transient. And so the expectation management around that um, is something that the science has highlighted, but uh, certainly on the restoration side, there's still this, uh, this problem with, you know, many early studies on the efficacy of wood placement projects focused on whether placed wood or log structures remained in place. Um, so with failure or success defined as a log or a structure moving, that's not rooted in a process-based understanding of what wood does. Um, that's just uh, rod, uh, That's just rooted in uh, sort of an engineering-based uh, uh, design mindset, which is useful for, for a lot of design problems, but uh, maybe in the case of a process like this in a dynamic system, it's not the best approach. A lot of these um, ideas, both on wood and beaver, have been synthesized into a variety of uh, guidelines. Uh, Steve Yoakum has uh, written a number of, uh, I think this is the third version, I could be wrong, I apologize, uh, Steve, um, on guidance for stream restoration, which includes a lot of this. There's uh, this, this version that Ellen and Steve and Dan Scott uh, have uh, published uh, just this year on managing, um, or last year rather, for large wood and beaver dams and stream corridors. There's BDA and beaver restoration guidelines, um, and these are from various agencies, Forest Service, the Beaver Restoration Guidebook, um, that, uh, 
Chris Jordan, Michael Pollock, Janine Castro, um, Kent Woodruff, Greg Llewellyn uh, put together. You look at this Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, um, Forest Service. So this is uh, is promising the the various agencies that have uh, sort of rallied behind these things. Um, moving on to some of the emerging science um, that's coming out. Now, Jeremy talked about the uh, Silverman case study looking at resilience. Um, this is uh, Emily Fairfax's uh, PhD dissertation, which I encourage you to download. Um, and uh, the title is Building Climate Resiliency in a Warming World from Beaver Dams to Undergraduate Education. And one of her chapters, using remote sensing to assess the impact of Beaver Dam on riparian and evapotranspiration. It's basically doing a more in-depth job, actually in the next door catchment in Nevada, um, to uh, one of the uh, example uh, sites that was used in the um, Silverman study. So that's really exciting. Then uh, I think I showed you yesterday in the principles talk, I showed you this uh, chapter, or sorry, I showed you this uh, picture of a landscape that had burnt to the ground except the areas with beaver. And Emily's hit that with remote sensing and done a really nice job, five, uh, five sites, uh, or five rather large fires across the West and, uh, and basically uh, quantifying some of, the, some of those impacts, that sort of death grip on the obvious thing that I pointed out, but actually, uh, putting some remote sensing uh, to that. Uh, she's also got a fourth chapter, which I think really just sort of embodies her whole ethos as just a really uh, effective communicator and uh, great teacher. Um, but uh, it's uh, this fourth chapter is about increasing the accessibility of these sorts of trainings in the earth sciences um, to, to folks with disabilities. And um, th whether you, whether it's that audience or um, you know uh, kids or uh, just the general public, this little 45-second video that's gotten over 16,000 hits, uh, this stop-motion story of what happens when a beaver you know modifies a stream, builds a dam, fire comes in. Um, you've got to watch this. This is this is amazing, and some high-profile coverage in EOS uh, on, on on the same topic. So Emily's been. So I'm, I'm excited by both the substance of, of, of some of this, this science um, emerging out of uh, grad, grad students that are, that are coming up and also that, you know, and Emily just uh, uh, has become a professor at Cal State University. Um, this, uh, this Smokey the Beaver webinar is well worth a watch uh, to get a, get a handle on some of these things. So um, another example of some really cool graduate research coming out, um, Tori Ritter up in, uh, up in Montana, uh, there's far too few um, like actual beaver ecologists or beaver biologists out there. There's all these people like me, a geomorphologist or hydrologist um, or other flavors of ecologists and you know fisheries biologists that are studying the impacts of beaver on the systems that they're interested in. But we know way too little um, about some of what beaver do uh, and some of their behavior. And so this is uh, a study in which he's focusing on ecosystem pioneers, beaver dispersal. Um, and uh, so just neat to see some really, you know, the, the hard work of the radio tracking and uh, actually going out and not just counting the dams and the results of their ecosystem engineering, but actually looking at their dispersal patterns and their movement patterns. Um, a lot of cool implications for how we manage beaver and use them as a restoration agent. Uh, moving on to some work in the UK, uh, Hugh Graham's uh, wrapping up a PhD over there with Richard Brazier and um, working with Alan Puddock and uh, he came over and uh, learned about the, the beaver restoration assessment tool model and then uh, kind of went back to the, the, the drawing board and took the kind of heart of that, the beaver dam capacity model, and uh, adapted it to deal with uh, the European and uh, UK data sets and to test it to see how well it worked for Eurasian beaver, it turns out. Um, works quite well. So this is uh, now being upscaled and run across the the whole of the United Kingdom. So neat to see those capacity models performing across hugely different physiographic regions. Um, and uh, But then he added a new twist with this beaver foraging index uh, model, which instead of just focusing on where beaver build dams, uh, which is very interesting to us from a restoration perspective, but kind of connecting to some of, for example, Tori's work, 
um, looking at you know areas that could support beaver, for example, it's bake dwelling based off this forage uh, index. And so putting those together can give you some hints about dispersal patterns, um, et cetera. And so this is being used to guide management uh, over there in the UK, which is, which is great. Um, so there's also uh, a number of uh, sort of review papers. Um, uh, this, this is sort of a meta-analysis. Uh, they try to do a survey of various projects, uh, Pilead and others. Um, beaver translocation projects, as well as artificial structure projects. And um, we know this is a huge underestimate. Um, I think that as much as anything has to do with uh, how, how few respondents they had to their surveys, but it is it is nice to start to see some of the distribution of some of these things. Um, Nick Weber will show some other examples of that. One of the things that comes up in this, um, these are some of the pictures that they show of artificial structures, artificial beaver dams. And I would absolutely agree with that label. These are artificial structures. This um, is a rock structure, um, these, these rock riffles. I mean, yeah, you might occasionally see a boulder riffle, um, but that's not something that beaver build. Um, and, then, and this is, uh, you know, boulders uh, used in systems uh, like this. It's, um, you know, it, it's, 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 it, I find it disingenuous to call that <laughs> beaver mimicry. Um, this is a check dam. Um, this is a highly fortified um, structure. I, I'm, uh, so these things, um, they put out this really good uh, point here. There's a need for better information regarding the effects and efficacy of different artificial structures that result in ponding um, in rangeland uh, systems. And so um, I also say there's a there's a need to better assess where different beaver uh, related restoration approaches are most suitable. Uh, for example, where are low profile rock structures most appropriate as opposed to wooden structures? Now, this is just sort of a segue into there's a lot of terminology out there. And, you know, does it matter? Are these all just the same thing? A artificial beaver dam, a BDA, these different flavors of BDAs, uh, simulated beaver structure, check dams, log weirs. Well, it depends, okay? Um, people are gonna interchange these terms. There's places where the BDA is, you know, gold and currency. There's other other places where it's, it's, it's toxic, right? It brings up uh, things people don't wanna think about, beavers and dams. And uh, you might be better to use something else that's a little less, uh, I don't know, like a leaky dam or a leaky wood structure, right? There's, the, the point is not the label and you're not gonna control the messaging uh, on these things. What I'm gonna do is just sort of review how the people who have coined some of these terms are calling these things. You've heard a lot from us on what we mean by BDAs. Um, now, artificial beaver dams, one of the places that came out of is out of the Sylvie's Ranch project. Uh, this is a project which I would argue is not at all low-tech process-based restoration. A lot of those structures could be built in low-tech ways. A lot of times they aren't. This was built with Tonka toys. And just because something's built with a Tonka toy, if it adheres to the principles, that's fine. Um, but one of the things they got right here was, you know, they covered 18 miles of stream and they built a ton of structures. They really got the strength in numbers. Now, the structures uh, you can see from space um, look like what they are. They are um, they're basically check dams uh, without a weir, and they are mimicking um, one of the functions that beaver dams do, which is backing water up and raising water tables. Okay, um, is it letting the system do the work? Well, maybe part of it. Is it deferring decision making to the system? I don't know. Um, self sustaining. Well, these will be here for a while because the size of the system they're put in are pretty, uh, you know, there's not, not, not a ton of disturbance. Uh, so it's not to say that this is uh, a bad thing, but this is not what we are talking about in this workshop with low-tech process-based restoration. And that nuance is confusing to people, and it's worth you being aware of that. Here's some more nuance, simulated beaver structures, SBS. So, um, well, here these guys say SBS is also known as beaver dam analogs. So, um, okay, that's fine. 
Um, there are human constructed features that function like a beaver dam. They slow the movement of water, create pools behind the features, and allow for higher rates of sediment deposition within the pool. A little bit, there's a focus on process there. That's interesting. Ultimately, they're a tool for adding complexity to a stream. That, that sounds like some of the rhetoric we've used. Um, but take a closer look at this thing, right? So what is it? It's a, uh, it's con these can be constructed out of iron materials. Well, that's fine. Here, they constructed them using untreated lumber. A trench was dug across the stream, uh, approximately, so they keyed it in two feet beyond the stream bank on both sides. It's a very old sort of standard approach to building um, in-stream structures, right? You got to key it in. Uh, six by six inch boards were cut to size, stacked and secured together with long screws. Uh, so this is just like an impenetrable barrier. You're just picking a fight with the stream and they notch it, they cut a notch in the top board to direct stream flow to the middle of the channel and prevent breaching beyond the stream channel. I'm sorry, but that has nothing to do with simulating beaver dam activity. Beaver dams spread water out. Beaver dams have a uniform crest elevation to spread water out. They do it precisely. They try to breach beyond the stream channel. Um, this whole training of foul wags, that's what check dams do, right? That's what broad crest weir structure, or uh, sorry, not broad crest, but uh, that's, a, that's what most of these sort of weir designs do where they concentrate flow in the middle. Um, this is important when we start talking about fish passage. These are the sorts of designs where fish passage may well be an issue. These are the designs that are rooted in fear that you might have bank erosion. Um, and so this is something where it depends on who does this. You know, a lot of people are getting part of the point, backing up water, backing up um, a pool behind this. Those, those, those are good things. You're simulating part of the process. Um, some of this, one of the first uh, recently to, to kind of talk about this, Paul DeVries has this uh, great paper emulating riverine landscape controls of beaver. Um, and so he's kind of just trying to emulate what primary dams would do, but he's doing it with these choke structures. Um, and these, these things, um, if this isn't low tech, right? I mean, Paul's a good friend. He's an engineer, right? This is, this is an engineered structure. Um, this was effective. It backed up water. It had more connectivity at high flow, et cetera, et cetera. It's not emulating a beaver dam. Um, it's emulating just the hydraulic backing up of water part in the high flow. Uh, why is there a hole right here? Fish passage, okay? So using natural building materials, I guess, yeah, I got that part. Letting the system do the work. Well, it's letting it do part of the work, but it's certainly not deferring decision-making. It's really making a decision for the system and how that's going to work. I didn't, this is not a self-sustaining process. Um, these are expensive. These are not going to be the sorts of things or there's strength in numbers, and they're certainly not messy. So the more fundamental question I would argue, not the label you give it. People will use these things inconsistently, okay? But are the structures designed to mimic hydraulic processes of beaver dams, i.e. back water up and raise those water tables? Or are they designed to mimic and promote a process of beaver dam activity, which includes this much richer range of processes? And, you know, whatever you want to call it, what we're pushing here is promoting um, be, uh, be the process of beaver dam activity. Um, that is not a judgment on whether or not these are ever appropriate sorts of structures. There are certainly situations where these may make sense. There are also situations where beaver dam activity may happen on top of those. Hell, beavers build on, you know, constructed riffles all the time. They build on, you know, shopping carts. They build, you know, they, they're extremely opportunistic. My question is, given the cost and the impact and the sort of permanence of some of these other uh, attempts, other, other types of things, you know, is that really necessary to promote beaver dam activity? It may, it may get lucky, um, but those are, those are long lived decisions. Some of this confusion comes out in a recent review, or sorry, it's an invited commentary. Um, so it's not really a scientific paper. Uh, it's peer reviewed, but it's a commentary. Uh, by Louts and uh, actually some other partners of, of, of Jeremy and ours. Um, and the first thing they have in the paper is a quote, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, what they're talking about um, with beaver dam analogs is equating it 
to these things, okay? And a lot of people have been installing a lot of structures and calling them Beaver Dam analogs. Um, so this is a fair quote in that context. They're also saying that the enthusiasm around ABDs and BDAs is the same as natural channel design enthusiasm, and it's rampant and it's dangerous. Maybe, okay? Um, you guys are all part of that. I don't know why there's so many of you um, on a call here, but I think it's because you have hope about what could be done with, uh, with, with these sorts of treatments. I would argue that if what happens is these very old sort of uh, types of structure treatments and designs become what BDAs mean, that this is a fair concern, right? We've been building those sorts of structures and sometimes they work, but they are missing the broader point about really engaging processes and letting process do the work. There's some conclusions that they have in this paper which are hard to argue with. Research efforts need to be tightly coupled to practitioner goals. Pre and post assessment is critical. Moving beyond the reach scale to assess cumulative impact and collaboration with stakeholders. These are hard to argue with, other than maybe two, that this shouldn't be one and done. You know, Most of those structures that we're just looking at focus on stability. You build it, you look at it before, you look at it after, it makes for a nice master's project. I'm sorry, we need to get away from you know convenient science and we need to get towards uh, what Jeremy will talk to us about as uh, co-produced science. I'll show you a slide in a moment on that. Before we go there, uh, we are going to tap uh, the rest of the uh, morning's instruction team to kind of highlight some knowledge gaps when I pushed them on this before. Um, there's a lot longer list than this, and you know we may hear some from the audience too. Uh, but the cumulative impacts on timing of flows, there's been a lot of studies looking at what happens in a little reach or a beaver dam complex in terms of uh, hydrologic uh, impacts uh, that follow the hydraulic. Uh, but we don't have much that looks at a cumulative impact of that, and that's a much harder problem to study. Um, we need way more things like what uh, Tori is doing on beaver behavior and population dynamics. Um, we also need to address, there's a whole faction um, of, of researchers uh, on some of the, on the beaver side that are basically buying the compensato uh, compensatory mortality hypothesis um, that if beaver are present, they're, you know, the system is already at carrying capacity. However, that fails to recognize that beaver are ecosystem engineers that um, have the ability to change carrying capacity in these environments. And that's, that's really fundamental, not just for themselves, but for a whole host of aquatic and terrestrial organisms uh, that depend on these riverscapes. And, you know, we really don't know much about the genetic mixing of, of beaver populations. There's other things. Where we want to leave you is um, a call, really, to both the management and practitioner community as well as the science community for co-production of science um, from start to finish. We need to roll up our sleeves together. We need to think about what are the, the problems, what are the knowledge gaps that are, um, that are uh, fueling those problems. Um, and get away from this sort of loading dock um, approach to science delivery where, you know, we're the scientific experts that just come in independently and we're going to look at it and we're going to tell you how it is and what's wrong um, and what's right. And, uh, you know, we're maintaining our independence. Um, that's a neat notion. But, you know, studying natural systems and particularly studying a practice like restoration, that just leads to bad study designs, uh, miscommunication. Um, and flawed logic. Um, so let's let's co-produce this stuff um, to make sure that it's relevant and useful. Uh, that's all I've got. Uh, thank you very much for your interest. Take care.